So, um, so the uh, Accra New South Wales South Branch Committee um, are happy to welcome everyone to our seminar today on unveiling silica dust, understanding the risks and implementing effective solutions. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Kieran Smith. I'm the president of uh, the current president of Accra um, and spent the first 20 years of my career uh, on site, um, only ever in concrete repair and remedial works on buildings. And I reckon I spent probably a good eight or nine years with my head over a bucket of repair mortar and uh, without without any kind of um, dust or respiratory protection. So this is a, a seminar I definitely would have loved to have uh, been a part of uh, back in the in the late nineties. Um, so so we are talking about um, the risks and and effective solutions for silica dust. Um, extremely important for industries worldwide. Um, silica dust generating activities such as cutting, drilling and grinding of various materials pose significant health risks to workers if not managed properly. As industries professionals, it's essential to stay informed about the dangers associated with silica dust exposure and learn about effective solutions for mitigating its impact. Fortunately for us today, we have two leading experts who are going to delve into the exciting world of silica dust and provide valuable insights to ensure the safety and well-being of our remedial workforce. Today we're going to explore the potential health hazards, legal regulations and best practices for controlling and monitoring silica dust levels in our workplace. Um, I think it's definitely going to be something we're going to hear more and more about as people, especially from my generation, reach their 50s and 60s and start, we, we may or may not be starting to see some, some big problems from those years of breathing in all of that dust. Um, and I think that goes out to the new build space as well, concreters and bricklayers and everybody who uh, who uh, was fortunate enough. Um, our presenters today are Dr. Martin Sterling, Head of Worker Health and Safety, Circularity and Aftermarket Services. And Kevin King, who we are waiting to join us, is the Director of CSH Consulting Proprietary Limited, um, a Master of Science in Occupational Hygiene Practice and a Bachelor of Engineering in Mechanical Engineering. So some very, very well qualified people um, to take us on our journey this afternoon. But before we do get there, none of this is possible without our fantastic sponsors that Acra have had and our longtime sponsor, Seeker. Uh, Andrew Nunn from Seeker Australia, um, who are our sponsor for today. Andrew's the senior target market manager responsible for engineered refurbishment, flooring, ceiling and bonding and building finishing products. There you go, Andrew, that's uh, just about covers nearly everything from from Seeker. Uh, Andrew spent more than 30 years specialising in tile adhesives under tile waterproofing and facade mortar segments with Davco and Seco following the acquisition of the Parrot Davco business four years ago. Prior to this time, Andrew was working as a drafting, working as drafting structural design details. Um, so Andrew and, and Seeker uh, have got a, a bit of a quick presentation for us following that and we'll jump into our uh, main presentation. Over to you, Andrew. Okay. Thank you very much. I'll just share my screen. Yeah. Thanks for the um, uh, introduction, Kieran. I mean, just a little bit of background before we get into the dust and silica aspect of uh, what we're going to talk about. Uh, our pedigree in relation to dust, dust suppression goes back more than 10 years uh, in our former life under Parex before we were joined by Seeker. And they spent a lot of time, uh, they were ahead of the game in relation to uh, improving the quality of work for tradesmen on sites. So the video you're about to see is not actually um, EHS compliant when it comes to PPE equipment. Uh, it is a little bit old because remember it was done 10 years ago in France, but these are the uh, products that we actually have in the market today and have done for so long. So I'll just start this video. Can you see that? Yep, got yeah. it. Um, I think I'll just, I'll, I'll send the link for the video because there's shorter time. So this basically is uh, a test that's conducted in our, our manufacturing facilities in Germany under the company named Shonox, which is a seeker owned business. It's conducted with a machine um, which is Basically, it's it's called a Dustman. It's a dust analysis machine, and it tests the material to the CPAC 503 international test methodology for the dust dustiness of granular products. Okay, 
So what this does is the bottom three lines are actually three different products that we have of our product using the dustless technology. And the products above are actually competitors' products uh, in the same class of product. And you can see the difference between the dust generated um, when mixing the product. So basically, it's an 80% uh, suppression of the airborne dust when these products are actually um, produced. So that's been in the market over here for 10 years. Unfortunately for us, the awareness on building sites 10 years ago for the uh, concern of dust wasn't as prevalent as what it is today. And so tradespeople didn't necessarily see the value of this. However, that is improving now. What I will do now is also share the next slide, hopefully, which is our latest uh, um, improvements, which combines the dustless technology with actually a silica-free mortar product. So this is the angle that we're going down into the market now. So not only is the product dustless, it also contains no silica. So then the risk of exposure to the people on site, as well as people within our own manufacturing facilities, is, is reduced to zero. So that's what we wanted to share today. Um, unfortunately, obviously, the video didn't work, but it was a very good graphical demonstration about it. Um, and this range of the silica-free products is something that we're pushing through the market. So every one of our products, we're trying to, where possible, reduce the silica, but everyone will be dustless. So. I hope that's of interest. Thank you very much. Um, so question, questions, guys, please throw them into the Q&A section of your viewer. You should see it down the bottom there. Um, Deb will have a look at those questions. If she thinks that those questions need to be answered during, she will. Otherwise, generally, what we like to do is keep them to the end. Um, so that we can get a bit of a dialogue going between our two panellists and our moderator. Um, without further ado, I'm going to jump out and hand over to Deb. It's nice to have everybody here. Um, there were certainly a number of people who have registered and, and we're really lucky to have a range of people. We've got building practitioners, design practitioners, um, from memory uh, professional engineers. We've got a range of contractors um, and it's really nice to see um, people really interested and genuinely wanting to improve their health and safety in their workplaces, and in particular this topic area. I also think we've got people from around Australia, and also um, I think Nicole had told me there's someone from New Zealand, so welcome, welcome all. My background is um, I've done probably, I work with RHM consultants, I'm not sure what um, Kieran um, said, and I'm also the Vice President of, of APRA New South Wales. So in my role as at RHM Consultants, I'm the Manager of Risk and Compliance. And um, health and safety is obviously one area of my, my work profile. I've worked in health and safety for probably about 25 years. And my original tertiary qualification was in OHS. So that tells you how long I've been in um, health and safety because we now call it WHS. So my degree has OHS, not WHS, if that makes a difference to anybody. Um, but probably more um, special to me is that in the last seven years, I've been working in the remedial industry and um, it's something I'm really passionate about. Um, having been brought up in the, in the building industry, uh, my family, and then of course going off doing all of my things, but I've come back to the building industry and bringing my, my passion for health and safety. Today, um, we have two great presenters of whom I will introduce you to, um, but I probably just want to make some comments on some takeouts that I'm hoping that you will take away with you today. And I'd love you to have a pen and a piece of paper now um, and write these down because these prompts are going to stay with you, I hope, and our two presenters will speak to a range of these so I'm going to, I've got some points that I am going to read and I hope you take note of. So the first one is, it's really important that you understand the health impacts of silica and asbestos dust. So that's really important. Number one, you need to understand that and you'll gain some sense. It's a short and brief one and a half hour webinar today. And um, we can't, we can only impart so much knowledge, but the main thing is if you leave today with an awareness, I think we've achieved what we've wanted to achieve. I can see Martin and I'm, I'm sure Martin would agree um, with that. 
So the second thing is, do you have a dust mitigation program in your workplace? And you'll learn more about that as we talk throughout this next hour. What dust extraction systems do you have in place or available to you? And I know Martin will speak to that. What work activities in your workplace, in the daily work that you do, generate dust? What are those activities? And what are you doing about that in mitigating the dust? What PPE and RPE do you have in place? Does your employer require of you to be wearing when you are doing your work? So PPE, personal protective equipment, or respiratory protective equipment, what do you use? Are you aware of the hierarchy of controls and the choices that are being made in your workplace? And are you contributing to how those controls are implemented? And are you aware of the regulatory requirements that provide this broader guidance and expectation on how we do manage dust in the workplace? So they're really important and I'll probably come back to those um, just as a way of reminder. But what I'd really like to do now is um, introduce um, Dr. Martin Sterling. And I've got a couple of screens, so I'm looking at you here on my left. And um, Martin's here today. Um, and he, I'll oh, just a very brief introduction of Martin. He's um, head of WHS at Hilti. His background, he's a mechanical engineer. Um, he does have a PhD because he's a doctor. Um, I haven't had time to read your PhD yet, but I'm sure you bring great experience uh, to this conversation today with, with your um, research and um, work that you've done over throughout your life. You've been at Hilti for, since 2004, and um, you're passionate about the safe use of power tools. As well, you're really committed to trying and striving, as I, um, in embedding of safety culture in our industry. And I think that's why we're all in this room today. So, um, and there's one other comment that I wanted to make because I have, um, in, the in the past seven years, I have written uh, a dust mitigation program. And in that dust mitigation program, Martin, I had included, um, we incorporated Hilti, Hilti products and systems within that dust mitigation program. And it was really um, awesome to be able to use, have great products that I know would reduce the um, generation of dust and mitigate that. Um, so that's my experience, definitely working um, on dust mitigation, and we we included um, Hilti products in that. So welcome, Martin, and I'll hand over to you. You've got about 20 minutes, um, and then once you've um, completed your presentation, people will be placing their questions online. I will be checking that on and off, and um, I can see Kevin's here as well. Welcome, Kevin, And um, but over to you, Martin. Thanks, Deborah. And just, uh... If there's any problem with the sound, just please, uh, please, please raise, uh, please raise your hand, um, just to make sure that I'm, uh, I'm at least audible. So I'm going to share my screen. All going well. And can I just confirm that you can see my screen, which says managing the hazard and risk associated with respirable crystalline silica dust. I'm hoping that everyone can see that. So really the um the, the focus of uh, of this presentation is is trying to address some of those questions that um that Deborah has put out there. Um throughout this presentation, we're going to be looking at uh exposure levels on a per application basis. And we'll be going into a little bit about uh as a as an introduction what silica, uh what crystalline silica is, um, without going into too much detail because I know that Kevin is covering quite a few of those variables as well. So uh, I'll jump right into it. So what is uh, respirable crystalline silica? It's quite a mouthful, so I just call it RCS, right? Um, you know, you pretty much are going to find crystalline silica or quartz. Quartz means hard in German, ironically. You pretty much find it in, in, uh, in a large part of the Earth's crust. So whatever construction material you're going to be dealing with, we, we will be finding uh, crystalline silica or quartz. And you can see those beautiful micrographs there um, of, of it in its undisturbed form. And then um, once it uh, once it breaks down. Now, it, um, it breaks down in construction applications um, fairly, fairly predictably. And uh, I'm just going to go to my next slide, which shows the particle size distribution of how it breaks down in 
drilling, grinding, breaking, and cutting operations, which are the kind of operations you'll see on an everyday basis in your remedial operations. And it's fascinating to see and get a, a sort of a first-hand feel of, uh, of what happens. So generally you find these particular applications will break down those um, silica particles, those coarse particles that we saw in the previous slide. They'll break them down into a particle size distribution ranging between you know, close to zero, extremely fine dust, all the way up to maybe 200 microns, so the coarser particles. And about 10% of the size range will lie in the respirable range, right? So when I say respirable, less than 10 microns in aerodynamic diameter, and those can find their way into your lungs. And I, I think Kevin is going to be going more into the exact health impact of, uh, of, of those particles if they find their way into your lungs. But um, uh, let, let's, just, let's just deal with a practical example of what that means, right? So if we're doing a, um, uh, a, a remedial uh, sort of project where there's a bit of um, uh, concrete backgrounding to be done, you know, if, if, if I'm grinding away with a, with a Hilti six inch concrete grinder and it's between 70 and 90% power, we'll probably generate three kilos worth of dust on a per hour basis, which is quite a lot. So looking down that particle size distribution plot below, maybe 10% of that would be respirable. So let's call that 300 grams of dust. So that's sort of as much concrete dust as I could hold in my hand, right? That would be about 60 grams of dust. Now the proportion of quartz or silica that you'd find in that would maybe be between 20 and 40% if we're looking at concrete. Sandstone's much, much higher. Sandstone's, you know, in the 80s. Uh, and brick can be in the in the in the fifties, but let's say maybe um, uh, sixty grams of that is uh, is is respirable dust. Um, so that's um, that's quite a lot, you know, enough uh, enough really hazardous dust to hold in your hand with a typical grinding operation if it was left completely uncontrolled. So then, you know, of that. 60 grams of dust, 60 grams of silica that I'm holding in my hand, you know, what, what is a, um, what is the working exposure standard? And you notice that I say, I don't say what is a safe level because there's no such thing as a safe level of dust. No dust is uh, of any amount is good for you. Um, but really the working exposure standard has been set at um, uh, 0.05 milligram per cubic meter. And that would mean if I'm sort of comparing that to that quartz that I'm holding in my hand, that 60 grams of quartz, um, the working exposure standard is, is about half a match head of that pile of dust that I'm holding in my hand, right? So um, that has been set at a level which is um, estimated to be the, the sort of the levels that the body could cope with in over an entire working period of your life, right? So it, it really means that if you're going to control and manage silica dust in, uh, in an application, um, you've got to do something pretty dramatic. It's not about managing residual risk. It's about going through that hierarchy of controls through, um, uh, you know, uh, elimination, substitution, engineering controls, administrative controls, and then mopping up the residual risk of that half match head uh, with, uh, with RPE. And it was great to start off our session this afternoon to, to see um, um, to see Andrew's example of uh, uh, of substitution, or you could call it elimination, but that seeker product are completely pulling out crystalline silica for some of their products. So that's um, that's definitely the way that the industry should be working. Now, um, you know, if we're going to be developing systems to to uh, to manage silica uh, to manage silica dust, clearly there need to be tests to kind of assess the effectiveness of those particular systems, so you can make them better and better and better. Um, but it but it also allows us to link that kind of test data to see how are we going relative to the working exposure standard, and therefore you know what's the role of of uh, of RPE, how long can we do these applications for in terms of hours ex of exposure. And um, is, it, is there anything extra that we need to think about when we're putting our controls and our control plans in place? So I'll go through the, the test and um, it's, it's, it's important to go through what, what these objective, what, what these standard tests are. Um, so you can kind of understand the data a, a little bit better and not, and not just take it at face value. This test is known as 
the standard test is known as EN50632, pretty elegant name. Um, and there's some pretty rigorous uh, requirements around the different tests that you do. And not just the nature of the tests in terms of drilling, grinding, cutting, and breaking, but um, even in terms of the, um, uh, you know, the, the setup of the particle monitors, and very importantly, the type of concrete that you use in terms of the aggregate distribution, aggregate proportion, et cetera, to try and keep things consistent. And despite all of that, I'm sure you can appreciate there's a fair amount of variability in all of those tests. So um, in, the, in these standard tests, um, two things are measured, uh, respirable dust, that's stuff that's um, less than 10 microns in diameters, and those are uh, measured with monitors that are attached um, you know, close up on a person's chest, closer to the breathing zone, and the monitor for the inhalable dust is uh, a little bit below, which is a slightly coarser dust. And tests are conducted with the user wearing these um, for a one hour period. And it's done in an enclosed space. It's done with no air exchange uh, whatsoever. The room is only cleaned between tests, completely scrubbed between tests. And the, um, the room volume is um, 200 cubic meters. And uh, it needs to be of a fairly consistent dimension. And these dimensions need to remain quite consistent between, you know, test facilities because, you know, you, you're measuring, you're measuring dust uh, at the person. The dust is, you know, is sort of being moved away from the, from the workpiece and it can buff it around the room, can buff it off the ceiling. So try and keep things aerodynamically as consistent as possible in these test centers. And this is a picture of our test center, our test room in our dust competence center in Kaufring in, uh, in Germany. So all those Hilti dust tests are done in a centralized facility. Uh, and here's an example of, uh, of one of the setups. This is um, concrete grinding. I know it's an application dear to all of your hearts, near to all of your hearts. Wouldn't say dear, um, but um, it, it's done at a, uh, on, a, on, on, a slight, uh, on a slight incline. Um, and it's run over a, over a one hour period, and it's it's quite difficult with uh, with with grinding to to specify you know like a, a number of cuts or a number of holes drilled as you can in drilling and cutting. Um, but really, what the operator does is try and run the machine um, close to maximum power to keep it as consistent as possible. So the person involved um, works away pretty hard. The, the monitor on the desk behind this, uh, this gentleman doing the test is a, a real-time particle monitor as well. It, it's not required in the EN testing, but, but it's something that we keep track of. And you'll see how useful it is slightly later on when I show you the effects of using an air cleaner to, to scrub the air behind the operator. So I'll run through some of the, some of the tests, well, actually all of the tests that we've um, done according to EN um, to the, according to this this EN test, um, you know, over the over the last few years, so a wide range of tests have been done across drilling, grinding, breaking, and cutting operations, and um, it starts to reveal, you know, a reasonably clear ranking of um, RCS concentrations, and you you can hence start sort of linking that to a um, a, a level of risk as it were. Um, so you can really know, you know, which one of your applications you really need to be pouring more resources into to, um, to get under control. So, uh, you know, this is all about, you know, make, making sure that we don't be um, uh, focusing all of our attention on an application that is actually quite easily controlled. We rather divert our resources to the applications which um, are more difficult to control, spew more dust and hence result in a greater dust concentration. So yeah, quite a wide range of tests really um, to, to give us quite good coverage and then give us a good understanding of, um, of, of how the dust performs in these particular sort of scenarios and um, the different systems that you can use in different applications to control the dust. So there's, there's, there's four main kind of setups that, um, that, that you can use to control dust in, uh, in drilling operations. Um, from on-tool dust extraction, which is um, that setup where you see with the uh, next to number one, 
where the actual extractor is fitted to the tool itself. Then um, system two is where we fit a shroud to a, to a drilling machine. And that needs to be powered by, uh, by a vacuum cleaner, which I've marked with a gray spot above it because I use the gray spot as a key later on in the presentation. Another system that's available for drilling is using a, um, a, a hood that's on the workpiece. We call that a gecko because it can hang from the ceiling upside down. Um, and uh, that, that's, that's one way of controlling dust on a localized basis. And the final one is, um, is known as a, as a hollow drill bit where you can suck dust from the very tip of the drill bit because the drill bit has got ports machined into it. So dust is sucked through the center of the hollow drill bit uh, and then out the side using a vacuum cleaner. Um, and this is typically used when we are doing um, a chemical anchor injection because a really good, a really good um, byproduct of this particular setup is that you don't have to blow the holes out afterwards because the hole has been already cleaned because you've sucked the dust out as you clean it. So those are pretty handy. So what sort of results do these give? So if we can imagine the, on the um, on the on the y-axis is uh, is dust concentration, and um, the red line is the working exposure standard of 0 0.05, and these are dust concentrations that are accumulated in that EN test in a in a in a one-hour scenario, right? So it is a worst-case scenario. Um, you know, you know, typically typically. If you are if you are working outdoors, that dust is going to be self-ventilated pretty pretty quick, and it's going to disperse quite quickly. So it really represents the very worst that you can uh, that you'd anticipate. So you, we we see the on-tool dust extractors um, being um, being most effective and staying well below the working exposure uh, uh, levels within uh, within that within that one-hour test period. Um, but still close to the working exposure standard. And, and really where we want to be is at the actionable level of the working exposure standard, which is half that level. So we see that there's an immediate need to mop up residual risk there and, um, and use, um, um, use respiratory protective equipment. And as soon as you have a fitted P2 mask, which has got a reduction in factor of, of 10, if it's well fitted and we've clean shaven, um, you know, you're clearly well below that working exposure standard in, in a, you know, in a pretty well controlled environment. And you see um, uh, a similar kind of result with, um, with, with grinding close to the working exposure standard necessitating the use of, uh, of RPE. And then you can stay well underneath that, um, that working exposure standard. And again, I reiterate, this is in that, uh, in that enclosed space over a continuous one hour operation. So extrapolating that to actual working conditions is, is a little difficult. Um, I mean, this test isn't necessarily designed to replicate working conditions. The test is more designed that you can compare system to system um, and application to application, but it does give you a good indication of where you stand relative to the need to comply to that working exposure standard. And then breaking. Breaking is a very difficult, uh, is, a, is, a, is a very difficult scenario to, um, to control. And really, when you stand there doing some breaking, as I, as I was doing yesterday, you can really get a first-hand view of, of why that is. And it's it's because of the cracking, right? Um, the 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 cracks from where you're breaking really ex extend well outside of that impact zone that you're able to cover with any kind of a, a dust hood. So you get a lot of extraneous dust um, getting out uh, getting out into the uncontrolled area, and um, that's probably a segue to, to my discussion on the air cleaners a little bit later on. But what sort of results do these um, um, uh, do? Do does the does the control of a dust hood give um, an overall dust concentration? It um, it admittedly, um, if um, it sits above the working exposure standard, um, but it, it certainly does reduce when we look at the volume of dust that breakers generate. Um, you know, because of that wide kind of area where dust is emitted from, um, it uh, it stays above that working exposure standard, which is really important. Um, so it therefore becomes very important to be wearing respiratory protective equipment during that braking operation, because that's slightly misleading, right? You know, when you are doing braking, um, 
it, it doesn't billow dust in the same way as cutting or, or grinding does when it's um, uh, when it's uncontrolled. Um, but that, uh, believe me, that um, that respiratory uh, that respirable crystalline silica is very much present during breaking operations. Uh, cutting is an extremely difficult um, scenario to uh, to control, um, and whilst these uh, these dust hoods do remove the majority of um, of dust, you know, well well above the ninety percent region, it still necessitates wearing uh, RPE to stay well within a working exposure standard. Um, I mean, there is a there there are. You know, there's this dust extraction and there's uh, and there's wet cutting. Um, wet cutting does certainly suppress dust a lot, but doesn't necessarily take care of all respiratory dust. So when we do tests, when we're looking at the effect of of of, uh, of wet cutting versus dry extraction, you can see that you can get actually better than um, wet cutting when uh, when doing dry extraction, um, but but still pretty close uh, pretty close results. So. Just because you're doing wet cutting doesn't necessarily mean that you have completely controlled uh, the respirable crystalline silica in the environment. So that's um, that's a little bit of a watch out in that cutting scenario. So when you combine all of these together, you see a little bit of a trend from those um, um, and the ranking between the drilling, uh, grinding, breaking, and uh, and cutting operations. And and definitely we see when you get to those. Those um, those heavy um, breaking and those cutting operations, those are the ones to be really careful of, and make sure that we've got extremely good controls in place to um, to manage them. And I didn't go into it earlier, but I will spend just one minute talking about breaking um, as uh, as a further portion. Sorry, Martin, to interrupt. So I'm glad you said one minute. So I'm just letting you know there's five minutes left of this moment in time. So I'm hoping that's okay. That's it, because I'm I'm perfectly on time. So I am. Um, so I'll, I'll definitely be uh, be hitting that deadline. So um, the thing with breaking, it's a subtlety. Um, remember, right at the beginning of this presentation, I gave you an indication of the particle size distribution of, uh, of 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 dust during these different operations, and and I mentioned that it it ranges between you know close to zero to up to about two hundred microns. Now breaking is a bit of an exception to that. Breaking's got a much longer tail. It generates a much, much finer fraction of dust. And if you think about it, it makes sense. It's because when you're breaking and you're pounding that surface, the um, the cracks are, are being compressed and then relaxed, compressed, relaxed. So it's actually milling the dust between the cracks. So it generates a much finer zone. So that's um, it, it's something to be mindful of. Yes, it generates a high volume of dust and that dust is finer. So that's um, uh, uh, certainly an application to be very careful of when developing your controls. Um, so here's the view when uh, when uh, attaching RPE to this uh, to this picture and comparing that to the working exposure standard. So if I looked at at the um, the uh, the RCS concentrations across all of those applications, then put the reduction factor of a P2 fitted mask on, and I always use the language P2 fitted mask. And I should probably add clean shave into that as well. We see the overall dust concentrations is well below the working exposure stand and below the actionable level. But can I do more? The answer is yes. Um, you know, a lot of environmental dust is generated uh, in the background during these applications that can't be captured by the breaker, the, the drilling machine, or the cutting machine. And you can put an air cleaner in place to scrub that um, to scrub that background dust. And what kind of effect does that have? Well, the, 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 um, the gray line shows RCS plus air cleaner effect, and that's without the person wearing a P2 mask. And for quite a wide range of these applications, you can st you can stay below the actionable level when using this type of device. And um, you know these these are um, these haven't really taken off in the in the local market, but certainly we see in um, in in European markets, it's a pretty popular device to use in indoor applications and in uh, in light chipping applications. And um, a, a great control to uh, a great control to use, because the unfortunate thing with human behavior, when even when RPE is specified, unfortunately, as soon as a person stops using the trigger, they pull the mask off. So, then, just very in quick summary. So, yeah, there's um, the. I think the good news is um, uh, there are good controls, 
that uh, that that are in, out there in the marketplace, not just our not just our our own brand to manage um, silica dust risk. And um, you know the, the the data would indicate that as long as you've got these controls in place, and as long as you are using astute RPE, that you can still stay not just below the working exposure standard, but within the actionable level, which is very good news. Um, and and think laterally, right? Um, not just about engineering controls, but but potentially um, uh, elimination and substitution. We we didn't get into that. I'd love to get into that, but that's a topic for another for another time. And then, um, yeah, uh, and and think laterally in that stage between engineering controls and uh, and RPE as to what additional controls could I need to use before necessarily needing to be using RPE and um, you know save yourself that um, that human complication. So that's it for me. And always, as always, feel free to reach out for um, for for further info. And and of course, you know our our people are always willing to show you these. Um, these these pieces of gear uh, on site and in action. Thanks, Deborah. Thank you, thank you, Martin. And I'm hoping, um, and you may have had this chat with Nicole, um, but if we could have a PDF of your um, PowerPoint for our um, members to to access and review and read, um, that would be really helpful. Um, so we've already, so we've heard Martin spoken about a number of things that I mentioned in those first seven dot points. I won't go through those now because I'm really keen now to, thanks Martin, to invite um, Kevin. We'll be um, getting his screen ready whilst I introduce Kevin. So Kevin King, uh, he's director of um, CSH Consulting. And I, um, I've worked with Kevin over the last seven years and um, I'm really pleased to see and have Kevin here today along with, um, oh, where's Martin gone? He's, oh, <laughs> that's a good picture. Um, Kevin is an occupation, Kevin's um, a, a, an occupational hygienist. He also has mechanical engineering background. And um, some of you in the room are probably wondering what's an occupational hygienist. Well, I'll tell you some of the things and the work activities that he and I have been working together on over these past seven years. I'll just list them to give you a sense of the sort of work he does. But Kevin will talk more about silica dust and the particulates and how they impact our health. And he'll also talk about exposures and, and give you more detail, which then which fits in nicely with Martin's presentation. So we've um, Kevin and I have done a lot of site inspections, um, project reports and um, investigations on um, asbestos. I have asked Kevin to talk a bit about asbestos as well. That's certainly one of my passions, but silica dust, of course, is quickly catching up to the asbestos um, stories and um, both of them are absolutely critical in, in, in impacting people's health negatively. Um, he's also um, very involved in um, air monitoring. He and I have done work in confined spaces and, and Kevin has assisted me with um, preparing risk assessments for confined spaces, his air monitoring. He also um, um, tests samples of um, asbestos um, and also oversees the removal of asbestos from sites. Um, and I, um, we've certainly also, he and I have done training um, for remedial building staff and any people who are working in this zone um, in better understanding silica and asbestos, um, um, I guess, mitigation of the dust and the risk that is being um, put upon our, our workers. And it's certainly known that workers have died and do die as a result of exposure um, to these. It's just terrible to, 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 to our work, people are dying. So I think without any further comment, I will um, hand over to Kevin and he'll share his screen now, if he can. And he, he's got 20 minutes to take through his presentation. And all of this feeds into what does your dust mitigation program look like and why would you have one? So you're over to you, Kevin. It seems, well, I can't hear you, Kevin. Um, no, I can't hear him either. Hello? Uh, you're here, thank you. Yep. Sorry, we're just- There you are. Technical difficulties of getting this set up. 
Um, Martin, I really thank you for that presentation. The, um, it's interesting about the dust generation size and the equipment that's sort of used on there. Um, I've not seen that one before. Um, so what I'm going to go through, this is me, this is what we do for a living. That picture you can see on the left, that's chrysotile asbestos under what's called dispersion staining. It's one of the things we look for in when we're doing asbestos. But just to show you what I'm going to go through tonight. This is my contents. What is respirable crystalline silica? Martin's gone through a lot of this. The size and distribution of respirable dust. Uh, size and distribution of inhalable dust. Asbestos, its types, diseases from respirable crystalline silica and asbestos fibers. The risk rating, the effects on the body, how I monitor it. So Martin does it slightly different way, but I have to do for personal and um, static monitoring. The PPE required, control of dust from working environments, and Martin's just about covered all of that, so that'll be a lot quicker for me. Um, the regulations of work exposure, Martin covered some of that as well. Where are these contaminants found? And protection from respirable crystalline silica and asbestos fibers. So we'll go on to the next one. I think Martin covered some of this. So what is respirable crystalline silica? Uh, silica is the silicon dioxide. It's a naturally occurring mineral. It's um, abundant in just about everything you can imagine. There's the two types, uh, non-crystalline and crystalline forms of silicon dioxide. And when I do my monitoring, the analysis results from laboratories always come report respirable crystalline silica as quartz. So if we did some testing for you, you get a test result, you're going, oh, there's no respirable crystalline silica. It's because it's always just known as quartz. Uh, Martin touched on the next part, which is the respirable dust. It's basically around the 10 micron size. Uh, and I've got a comparison on the next slide. Um, and as Martin sort of alluded to, when you're talking about dust this size, you can't see it with the naked eye. It's so, so tiny. Um, so you may think there's no dust in the air, but if it's respirable dust, it's really there and it's invisible. Um, respirable dust, the reason it's dangerous, it can get into the furthest reaches of your lungs, so down to the alveoli and start blocking those up and creating problems in there. Uh, and as Martin alluded to, and his slides are much better at this than mine, is respirable crystalline silica is created when substances such as concrete or stone are cut, ground, broken up, drilled or worked on. So you take that and take Martin's slides and it'll tell you everything. Um, there is to know about it. The next one is just you will not see the respirable dust, only inhalable. So that dust you can see in the air, that's inhalable dust. In my world, the occupational hygiene world, that's big chunky stuff. That's like boulders. Um, we do monitor for that because it's important that we do that. But it's sort of also um, just very big. In our, my world, inhalable dust is a dust a fraction that's less than 100 micron in diameter. Uh, again, you can see it with your naked eye. That's the dust that's visible. Um, and most of this dust, although you do wear PPE to protect yourself, will be captured in the mucous membranes and the filtering system of your body. So you'll taste it. You'll swallow it but it's not really going to affect your stomach because it'll just pass through your body. Um, so it's usually disposed of the body by coughing or swallowing. And as most people know that have done this, when you're finished this sort of work and you blow your nose, it comes out horrible colours. 
but that's your body protecting you from like inhalable dust. So this is my comparison size. So you can see that's a five cent piece. The picture on the left is sort of a five cent piece. It says inhalable dust, 100 micron. And then the picture on the right has like the five cent piece, inhalable dust, and then respirable dust. And as you can see, when you compare, have a comparison like that, that's why it doesn't appear in the left-hand picture because it's so tiny, you just can't see it. So we're just gonna go through the asbestos fibers and the types. In Australia, there's mostly only three types of asbestos found. That's amosite, which is the brown asbestos, chrysotile, which is the white asbestos, which is the most popular sort of stuff, uh, chrysidolite, which is the bluest asbestos. That was what was mined at Wittenoon in Australia. And that's the most dangerous form of asbestos. It's banned in Australia from 2003, so you're not allowed to import it. I had to import some pure asbestos from the UK to be able to set up my asbestos testing lab. And I had to get all sorts of permits and permissions to bring it into Australia. And that was two grams worth of asbestos. Um, the remediation works on buildings, as Martin alluded to, or come across this, uh, well, he alluded to um, silica, but Remediation works on buildings will come across asbestos in just about every area you can imagine. It'll be in packers, it'll be in wall panels. It's used, um, they throw it in wall cavities. Just think of an area on a building and you're likely to come across asbestos. As your industry works on buildings which are pre-2003, because that's normally the ones that really require some remediation works, you should, a building owners should have an asbestos register, an asbestos management plan for those buildings. So when you go to work on it, you should be able to say, this is where all the known asbestos is. I can confidently go to that area and say, okay, I can isolate the asbestos and know that um, I don't have to touch that area. Or if I do, I uh, work under asbestos conditions. Production of all items with asbestos fiber content ceased in 1986. That doesn't mean it was, that's when they stopped actually using it. We've come across buildings or I've come across buildings which were built in the 1990s and it's still got fiber cement sheet in it. And what we've found is from some old builders, they had stockpiles of sheeting and they kept on using it until it was gone. Cause they said, well, what's, you know, it was good before it's good now. So um, we keep on, they just use it until their stockpiles were gone. Uh, all asbestos, a natural occurring mineral is strong. It's got very high um, tension properties. That's why they are used a lot of it in fiber cement sheet. And of course it's fire resistant. So just so you understand what asbestos looks like. This is a sample that's a 100 millimeter diameter Petri dish that you can see. So that sample is about 30 millimeters long and about 20 millimeters wide. We've circled the asbestos fibers. They're in there. There happens to be chrysotile, chrysidolite, and amosite. But those bundles you can see is probably in the thousands to tens of thousands of fibers. It, it's, if you can see it, it's massive amount of fibers. What you can't see in that picture is all the individual fibers because they're so, so tiny. When we find them, we're looking at through a microscope at 400 times magnification. So yes, you can see them there, but you've got to remember that's the very big and chunky stuff.
and this is sort of a comparison. Um, so that's, it's sort of, you can see that's what they're saying the diameter of an asbestos fiber is, and that's a human hair. So the asbestos, an individual asbestos fiber is about a tenth the diameter of a human hair. So it, they're really tiny. That's why they're so dangerous. And they come in the range of normally one to 10 micron. So again, when you go back to the other picture of the five cent piece, you've got to understand how tiny these things are. So if you can see an asbestos fiber, it's the thousands of tens of thousands of individual fibers. And again, we look at it when we're trying to find it at a magnification of 400 times. So it gets interesting when you're doing that work, because then you can see how much your hand shakes when you're trying to pick up an individual fiber with a set of tweezers or a pointer. So this is diseases from exposure to respirable crystalline silica. Uh, if a worker is exposed to, breathes in the silica dust, and this is where a lot of the stuff that Martin alluded to is really irrelevant, you can get silicosis very quickly. It's the acute silicosis. Uh, acute just means short term, and in this year, this sort of area, it's three to five years, you can get silicosis, it'll affect your lungs and you'll die. That's the outcome of silicosis. There's no, there's no other outcome when you've got it. Um, can develop in exposures of three to 10 years to moderate high levels of silica dust and cause inflammation, protein in the lung, a scarring of the lung. A scarring of the lung just means your lung becomes hardened and stops you being able to absorb oxygen and exhaust uh, carbon dioxide. And a chronic is long-term. So chronic silicosis, as it's got in here, is when you're exposed to small amounts of silica dust, but over a very long time. So you might be exposed to a little bit today, tomorrow, but it's accumulative in your body. So you may think that, ah, oh, this little bit of grinding that I'm doing or jackhammering is not really exposing me to much, but it is. And all those little bits go into your lungs, they add up, add up and add up. And then 10 years later, you wonder why you're short of breath. You go and take an X-ray of your lungs and you find out you've got this horrible sort of disease. So you can see some of the um, diseases that come from this. It's chronic bronchitis, emphysema. So you run out of oxygen, you run out, run out of lung capacity, lung cancers, kidney damage. Uh, and just we've put in the source of that is from Safe Work Australia. Just to point out what I was talking about, the lung on the left is a nice, clean, normal lung. The lung in the middle is a lung that has starting to form silicosis. And you can see the white parts are the ones that are becoming uh, fibrotic. So they're starting to harden up and that's giving you less come lung capacity. And the one on the right is when you sort of run out of lung capacity and you'll stop breathing. Um, so that's what it does to your lungs. That's why Martin and I talk about these things and the protection you've got to have because you are between the left hand slide and the right hand slide, you won't much notice much difference in your breathing capacity. But as you go from the middle lung to the right lung, you're going to notice that you're going to run out of breathing capacity extremely quickly. And then there's the ultimate one, which you're no longer here. So that was diseases from the exposure to silica, respirable silica. This is 
the disease from exposure to asbestos fibers. The outcome, when you look at the x-rays of somebody with mesothelioma or asbestosis, it looks similar. The lungs just harden, the lungs just become, I, look, I try to tell people it's, it's like slow drowning. You literally, your lungs are just hardening and you're using lung functional function. Um, so people who may be exposed to this uh, include builders, plumbers, electricians, you guys, the renovators and the um, remediation workers. Uh, and asbestosis. It's a serious lung condition caused by exposure to asbestos fibers. Again, these asbestos fibers are the single fibers that can get into your lungs, not those big chunky bits you can actually see with the naked eye. So the risk rating, the risk rating from for silicosis and asbestosis is extreme. Why is it extreme? Because the only outcome once you have this is death. And when you put that into a risk rating matrix, you understand that when this, when death is the ultimate outcome, it just puts it very high on the list. There are no known treatments for silicosis or asbestosis. And when we talk about this, there are some very lucky people who have been exposed to asbestos and their body, their individual bodies have gotten rid of the asbestosis. It's really super rare for that to happen. Um, and as we've all seen in the newspapers and everything else, silicosis is an acute disease. It, it's, kills you within three to five years normally. Uh, whereas asbestosis is it's a chronic disease, it's long-term, it's 15 to 40 years before you die of it. So you've got to, you'll be dying for a long time. Um, so the effects, again, the effects of both diseases is hardening of the lung tissue, which restricts the uptake of oxygen, a strange of carbon dioxide from the body. So my side of this is how to monitor this. We've got two types of monitoring we always do. One is personal monitoring. That's where I put a respirable head with a filter on it in your breathing zone. In your breathing zone is a 300 millimeter diameter around at the front of your face, a 300 millimeter diameter from your nose. So we typically put the respirable head on your collar. Um, you wear it all day. It's attached to a little air monitoring pump and that draws air in and that tells us how much silica dust uh, you was in your breathing zone for that day. The other one we do is static monitoring. And Martin slide had um, a dust particle monitoring sort of situation. We still use in Australia uh, for the static monitoring a respirable head. And it's a respirable head is just a, a head that does cyclonic action to get rid of the big chunky bits of dust and suck the small respirable dust in. These, the static monitoring is where you just put it in a specific place and that tells you the amount of respirable dust in that location. Because when we do respirable crystalline silica, we do two tests with the one filter. We do respirable dust loading. So we pre-weigh the filter, then we post-weigh the filter. That tells us how much respirable dust is on that filter. And then we, the lab that does that, then dissolves that filter and does their analysis work and tells us how much sil crystalline silica or quartz is on that filter. And that's where you get to your 0.05 um, milligrams per meter cube. 
because the meter cube is the amount of air. Five minutes um, of your presentation remaining, Kevin. Uh, I should just get there, I think. Um, as you can see, we the filters removed. It's way we weigh it into a um, set of balances or scales that have got five decimal places. So we weigh very small amounts of dust. For asbestos, we do what's called fiber counting. So we look at the filter, we count all the fibers and see how many are there, and that gives us our results for there. Martin touched on this again. All exposures require the use of respiratory protective devices, RPD, of the filter rating P2 or P3. Um, because P1 filters, when you look at it, are designed for big chunky par particles such as wood shavings and wood dust, not what we're talking about. There's two types of um, face masks. There's a filtering face mask, which is the disposables, and there's a tight fitting face mask, which is the reusables with a filter attached. Um, all RPD should be fit checked to each individual person. That means you get a score. It tells you how well that RPD fits your face. And you need a correction, uh, correction factor, protection factor, sorry, of greater than or equal to 10. Anything less than that, and it's not protecting you from the sort of dust. Um, Again, each person may require a different RPD because it depends on your facial features and your facial structure. You must receive training on how to use the RPD and if it's a reusable on how to store it and maintain it. Because you've got to learn how to clean it, when to clean it, what to store it in, how to look after your own equipment. And you normally, we recommend that each person is issued with their own respiratory protective device. It's theirs to look after. They then have to, if it's a reusable, they maintain it. They change the filters. They look after everything about it. With PPE, you may also need to wear coveralls, you know, the disposable type, because you don't want to wear your street clothes when you're getting covered in respirable dust or silica or asbestos. So if you're doing concrete jackhammering and you're getting a lot of dust, you may, your company may look at it and go, well, we're going to protect your clothing from getting covered in this respirable dust by issuing with coveralls. Again, because you don't want to take this stuff home, you don't want to put it in your car, you don't want to walk around a site spreading respirable dust. In the last two minutes, Kevin. Um, control of dust and regulations. Crystalline silica dust that's generated must be controlled. It's, it's a legal requirement now. If you are not controlling it on site and safe work walk in there, they can instantly shut down your job site. They can fine you massively, uh, you as an individual and your company. Um, as Martin alluded, his slides are much better that it's dust from working with concrete or other substance that contain quartz. I knew of the vacuum attachments um, because Martin's company supplied them to some of the other companies that Deborah used to work for. Great thing, great tools to work with. If you wet down the, the dust, then the water must be captured and disposed of as contaminated waste. So then water is very expensive to get rid of because it weighs so much. So if you're cutting with a grinder and you're doing wet cutting and you're just letting it run off, you can't do that because when that dries out, you've still got respirable crystalline silica dust that you'll walk through and just spread. And so whatever way you do it, you've got to control it. Uh, respirable crystalline silica and asbestos are legislated 
hazardous materials and covered under the, the workouts and model work health and safety regulations 2017. As Martin alluded to, respirable crystalline silica has an exposure of 0.05 milligrams per meter cube. So that's the amount of respirable crystalline silica for every cubic meter of air drawn through that filter. Asbestos has a workplace exposure standard of 0.1 fibers per milliliter. And again, it's the amount of fibers caught on a filter. You can look all these up in SafeWork New South Wales workplace exposure standards for airborne contaminants. And it has a listing of all published WES. Martin's alluded to a lot of this, whereas respirable crystalline cellular makes up roughly 40% of concrete, but that varies depending on the concrete mix and the material. It comes in natural stone, sand, sandstone, granite, water, clay, stone bench tops, and man made bench tops. A lot of companies are reducing the amount of silica in those man-made products. And as again, as Martin alluded to, exposure is via mechanically abrading. And my, when I call it, that's jackhammering, grinding, touching it with any mechanical device is really what causes that respirable dust. Um, and asbestos can be found in packers around doors, window frames, as formwork on Cairo, as eaves, as fascia. I've seen it in just about anywhere you guys work. So you need to be careful on old buildings because I've seen it where you're jackhammering through floors and next thing, oh, hang on, we've just jackhammered through asbestos and we've created friable asbestos. And that's when you get into a world of hurt. Last minute now, Kevin, how are we going? Strong messages, strong yeah, messages. My last slide. So, protection from asbestos or respirable crystalline silica dust. We're a properly fit checked P2. That means you have been tested to see that your P2 mask fits you properly. Be clean shaven. If not clean shaven, we're in a closed P2 hood. That's a hood that fits over your head and has a neck collar. It does the same thing. It's really uncomfortable wear a hood, but that's the only way you can do it. Use the correct equipment, vacuum attachments for grinders to capture dust when you're dry cutting. Do not allow dust to be spread, do not sweep. Whatever you do on your job sites, don't sweep the concrete dust. It just because all you're doing is aerosolizing it, putting it in the air and you're gonna breathe it in. You're going to get contaminated. You're going to spread it everywhere. Get one of Martin's vacuums and vacuum it up. Um, we recommend you wear disposable coveralls when you're working with this. That, again, that's to protect your uh, street clothes. If you have specific work instructions for working with asbestos, respirable crystal and silica. So that all your people are trained in this. They know what they're doing. They have something to refer to. Uh, if using a vacuum, have a written procedure of how to handle the vacuum, how to empty it, how to manage the, the bags that come out of it, disposable ceiling storage. And in Australia, we call them class H vacuums. And that's for vacuuming out all respirable dust. That's the end of my presentation. I'm sorry, I went to you both, um, honestly, what you've said it resonates deeply with me, having worked in this sort of area for seven years. I just want to make some concluding comments because ultimately I need to hand back, we need to hand back to Kieran um, for questions. But I, I think there's certainly a lot of information here, but I just want to come back to the, to the dot points um, that I originally um, referred to. Understand the health impacts of silica and asbestos dust. I think it's clear people die if they are not protected from these dusts. They're hazardous. My next question, which I think is the guts of all of this today, is do you have a dust mitigation program? What does that mean? Do you have a program in place? 
you meaning go back to work and talk to your bosses. Obviously, if your bosses aren't here, talk to them about, well, how we, when I go to work, I can see dust. Oh, what's this? I'm oh, sorry, I'm getting a message. Um, you need to think about what, what equipment do we have? What RPE, what PPE do we have? What can we do to reduce the dust that is generated in our workspace? It is absolutely essential. And I certainly, um, with the Hilti um, products, there are some extraordinary um, um, pieces of equipment and systems that can be put in place that protects the worker, protects us, protects you, and you go home healthy. It's just so essential. So do you have a dust mitigation program? And if you don't, put your hand up to, to draft something and write something for your organisation. Have a look at the programs and the, and the um, products that the, the likes of Hilti and other companies um, provide to the industry. I certainly know Hilti when I developed this program and Kevin was a part of that in my last um, employment um, in, in, we, in trialling the Hilti products, you know, people coming to your workplace and showing you how they work. It's, um, it's really important to have the right equipment. I, I can't express that enough. I think that's probably um, all I will say. Oh, there's one last thing. Asbestos has been fully regulated and you can't use it anymore. I truly believe silica is going to follow this same pathway. This is what I believe. Um, it's not as tightly regulated as asbestos is today, but I think that will come um, and we don't want to see people, more people dying as a result of inhalation of silica dust, certainly, and not asbestos either. Um, but the tightening of the regulations will come. That's my, that's what I anticipate. And probably the team members here would probably say the same. So um, that over to um, Kieran um, or Nicole now. Yeah, I'd love to say Kieran, but we lost him. <laughs> okay. Well, let's have a look at the questions there. We have one from Hayden Reynolds. Um, it's not a question, I think it's more of a statement, but something that needs to be shared. Um, a H class is only for limited time and should be recertified every six to 12 months. That's correct. Um, because of the nature of the materials they handle, every 12 months they should be sent back to a person that can clean them change the filters and they do a DOP test on them to verify that the whole suction train is not leaking. Um, Can I comment on that as well? Um, you know, it's, it's regulated very strictly that for asbestos work that an H class is required. Um, for working with, um, with crystalline silica, uh, there's a choice between uh, M or H class vacuum cleaners, except for the ACT where uh, H class is specified. But actually, when you look at the Australian standard for vacuum cleaners, um, an annual service check is required for both M and H class. And as uh, as Kevin says, it's it's um, it, it checks um, uh, the, the the tightness of the machine, the air tightness of the machine, and that test is done in order to ensure that the suction capacity of the vacuum cleaner is remaining very consistent. Because you can imagine the scenario, right? You have a four-year-old vacuum cleaner and uh, it hasn't been well maintained and its suction performance is probably half of what it was when it was brand new. So you need to be doing those annual checks to be making sure that those vacuum cleaners are still working as they should. It's really imperative. And certainly something I've observed in my time as site inspections, I was horrified, um, uh, but with um, one of the um, vacuums, they were reusing the bags. So I saw the contents dumped out, like, it, 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 and, and I really would encourage people to please don't reuse the bags that go to these commercial um, vacuum cleaners. You you keep it tight. You keep the the particle the particles in the bag. You discard it. It's more expensive. I was told. I remember at the time. And I thought, well, yes, so is my life and your life. Um, it's it's just essential. It's really, I call it common sense, but sometimes I see that lacking in the broad industry. Um, it's just essential. The, 
the bags, they're the vacuum bags that come with those vacuum cleaners are not meant to be reused. They're designed that once you take them off, there's a cap that goes over the opening. They go into another bag um, and they're disposed of. That's it. Because if, you, if you're pulling them out, emptying them out, you might, as well, you might as well just sweep the area and put all that dust into the air. Because that's the equivalent of what you're doing. I think your comment by, uh, could have been Kevin on sweeping as well. I mean, I've been involved where the prohibition notices have been given and, and, and I think um, it's really critical. Um, I think there's a lot of um, information that people need and today's about awareness raising. And I don't think people should beat themselves up if they don't know about this. This is all about getting information, taking it back to your workplace. The more people can talk about this, Online Safe Work New South Wales has an enormous amount of information on this. There are codes of practice. There are all sorts of booklets and information. Start there. You know, this is the beginning. Look at the recording of this again to have prompts. It's absolutely essential to get the word out there because, you know, you guys, are, I say you guys, I'm not, I haven't been there with a jackhammer and, or with a grinder. Um, I've watched it and, and it's hard work. And I think um, you all deserve the respect. Um, to go home with 100% health. And I, and I think that um, if you start talking about this in your workplace, talk with your colleagues. It's about talking to your management and the business owners about this in a fair and reasonable way. And, and, and I think you will only get people's support. It's about by having these discussions and consultations that you'll bring change to your organisation. And it's really essential. And I implore all people to go away from today's um, webinar and take some action in a positive way for your workplaces and, and broader companies, other workplaces. It's five o'clock and how are we going for, is there anyone what questions there, Nicole? Sorry, I wasn't um, it's, it's more for New South Wales, but you know, you guys may know, um, Tony Saber has asked, there's a dust bus coming around from WorkSafe New South Wales. Have you heard when they will be increasing the fleet and where and when can we access it? It's meant to give us lung tests and fit testing. I'm not familiar with that. Kevin, do you know? Yeah, that's, it's it's a service provided by Safeworth New South Wales. I'm familiar, but I'm not familiar with the answer. I'm aware of it, but I don't know the answer. Yeah, Sorry. so they'll come around and I'll do a lung function test and I'll do a chest x-ray. And they'll tell you, you know, how well your lungs are functioning. Um, they typically don't do fit testing, but they, their whole idea is they do the lung function. So they've got a doctor on board, they do the x-ray on board. And so the doctor looks at the x-ray and says, your lungs are good, or he'll just tell you whatever. And they do the lung function test. Um, just to see how well your lungs are actually functioning, how much air you can blow out in a certain set amount of time. And that tells the doctor what sort of condition your lungs are in. Yeah. I can see Nicole at five o'clock. Um, I think, um, did you want to make any final, any panel, any Martin, do you want to make one final comment? Like just to, what are you, what's critical from today from your messaging? Yeah, I think your comments earlier were, were spot on, um, Deborah, and that um, you know, don't don't be tough on yourselves because you 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 don't necessarily think you have the right things in place. Um, rather, just reach out for help ASAP. Um, you know, there's there's multiple people willing to help and um, and and suggest um, what what you can do relative to the hierarchy controls to help you put a control plan in place. So yeah, reach out to to your to your existing partners in the in the industry, and um, you know I'm sure they'll be happy to help. And you've got two people here in Martin's company and Kevin's. That's the beginning, I think. Yeah. Kevin, a final a final words, Kevin. Brief, very. People are leaving. <laughs> Just make sure you do something about it. If you work where any sort of silica dust can be produced. Don't say, ah, oh, it's all too hard, or just talk to somebody like Martin or talk to myself. Um, 
I can tell you how, what to do and what testing to do to, to evaluate what sort of exposure you've got. Martin can tell you how to protect yourself with equipment. So yeah. just do something about it. Yeah. Start Thanks, somewhere. Kevin, Martin and I, I came in late to the meeting and I, I, I've got Daniel's name written here on my page right at the top of it. Um, Daniel is, um, Karina is the lead of our events team who was the idea from today's behind today's and the leader on today's opportunity. So I just want to call out, shout out to Daniel. Um, I don't know where he is in the room. I hope he's here, but I, if his team members here, just want to say thanks because I think your idea is excellent. And the more we get the word out, the better. Over to you, um, Nicole, do you want to close the session? Yeah, thank you so much, Martin, Kevin, Deborah, and of course, Andrew from SECO who are our sponsors. Um, and thank you very much to everybody who has um, popped in today. This has been recorded and um, once I clean up the recording, I will send it out to, um, I saw that there are a few people that came halfway through. So I'll make sure that um, the registrants um, receive that so you can see the parts that you missed. So thank you so much for today. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. See you. Bye. Bye.